Thanks very much, Izzy. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's my first time on Ventura, so I'm really delighted to see such a, a wide audience. And I've been around and had a chat, and there's lots of interesting comments and questions. So today's talk is on mood and food. I am going to talk a little bit very quickly about my background. Is the volume OK? Is that OK for everybody? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, just very quickly about my background. Uh, I've been a registered dietitian for, for 30 years now, and I spent 20 years in the NHS, and then 10 years teaching and researching at Bristol University. And now I've escaped, and I'm working on cruise ships. Yay! <laughs> so this is my sixth cruise uh, and first time on Ventura. But I'm absolutely passionate about nutrition, and I hope I'll be able to answer any questions you've got, help you with any issues you're interested in, and inspire you a little bit. Lots of people, when I was going around, said they wanted to be inspired by, by some new ideas for what to eat and how diet might affect health. Other talks this cruise, I'm here on every sea day, so I got on at Barbados and I'm getting off at New Orleans, so I've had a nice little section in the middle. Um, uh, so today's talk's on mood and food, but I'm also doing one on Wednesday at 4 o'clock in here uh, on superfoods. You've probably heard loads about superfoods. I'm going to have to ask the question, is there such a thing as a superfood, and if so, what is it? And let's see if we can find any that you, you might like, and that might be linked to any health issues that you're interested in. And then I didn't used to have anything about weight in my talks, but I got asked so many times about it, people saying they put on weight on a cruise. Who's put on weight so far since Southampton? <laughs> I've put on weight since Barbados, so <laughs> you're not surprised. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do some interesting, um, well, I hope it'd be interesting for you, uh, look at the background about all the stuff that's about weight loss in the press at the moment, and uh, some of my own tips and some of the tips from other passengers about how to try and avoid weight gain on a cruise. So we've put that one in. I've done it a few times, um, so I hope that'd be interesting for you. And I'll take questions at the end. I know there's something going on in here immediately after I've finished. So I'll be over at the back door at the end if anybody wants to ask me any questions personally. But maybe we'll also have a bit of time to go around with the mic. So I've chosen mood and food because this was the topic I did when I did my audition for P&O to, to say, could you take me on, a, let me go on a cruise because I think nutrition might be interesting. So this was the topic I chose for them, and the feedback was that people found things that they could relate to in it. And why is it such a hot topic? Well, these are just some headlines that I took out of the paper. Am I standing in anybody's way? I'll move a little bit further back, just in case. These are some headlines that you might have seen. So the Telegraph berries are the new mood-boosting superfood. Daily Express, I like this one, you pilchard, fish good for the brain. That was a genuine headline. New York Times, chocolate, the ultimate happiness food. Uh, USA Today, eat breakfast if you want to put a smile on your face. But these are just headlines, aren't they? What is the truth behind these? So that's what we're going to have a look at. We all have good and bad days, don't we? Who's having a good day today? We're on a cruise, aren't we? We should be having a good day. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be having 35 good days. Is it 35 days, this cruise? Yeah, so hopefully you will. But sometimes there's no real reason why we're having good and bad days. So what the scientists and nutrition researchers are looking at is what impact can what we eat and drink have on our mood. So obviously there's going to be reasons why we're in a bad mood. Maybe it's dark and it's raining, or maybe a bill's coming or something awful's happened. But all else equal, can what we eat and drink affect our mood? And there's my man there who's saying, you are what you eat. I like that picture because there's a lot of evidence to say that we are what we eat in terms of our health as well as our brain. So the research I'm going to look at is really involved around how we think, behave and feel. So how do food and drink affect those issues? How does it affect our energy levels? Because that's clearly linked into our mood as well, isn't it? And how does it affect how we deal with stress? And there's loads of interesting research now suggesting that what we eat and drink can help with stress. So we'll go through all of these. 
But first, I want to get a bit of audience participation. I always like to have a bit of interaction from my audience, so I'm going to put up some foods. And I want you to tell me whether you think they're mood-boosting or mood-busting. So, if you think it's... Uh, I'll ask you at a turn to shout out which one you think it is. So, there's the first one. That's porridge oats. Who thinks that's mood-boosting? Yeah. Boosting? Who thinks that's mood-busting? Oh, nobody. Okay, I'm going to have trouble fooling this audience. I can see that. We're getting more difficult. What about berries? So, was that headline true where it said berries are new mood-boosting superfood? Yeah, you think they're mood boosting? Anybody think they're busting? No, okay. Chocolate. Who thinks that's mood boosting? Yeah, okay. Anybody think it's mood busting? Oh, that's split the audience a little bit more. Okay. Red wine, that's tricky. Who thinks that's mood boosting? A few. Who thinks that's mood busting? A lot more people think that's mood busting. Interesting. Okay. All the answers will be in the talk as we go along. Water. Something as simple as water. Mood boosting? Yes. Yeah? Mood busting. Nobody thinks that. Okay. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. You think you, you were saying mood busting for water, were you? Okay. What about oily fish? Mood boosting? Yes. Yeah? Mood busting. Mm. Oh, one, okay, good. I like to see a bit of variety. Coffee. Boosting? Yeah, busting. Okay, that split the audience as well. Chilies. Boosting? Yeah, busting. Okay, a few people on that one. Uh, only got a couple more. Brazil nuts. Now, I was talking to somebody about Brazil nuts in the audience, so they're going to know. So who is it? Is it boosting? Yeah, or busting. Uh, okay, this is a good audience. Okay, so the answers will be in there as we go along. So just to start with a little bit of brain chemistry, just as a background to this. Our brain, um, obviously, the brain cells are created by nutrients. We need nutrients to uh, mend the membranes and create new brain cells. So nutrients are really important for the structure of the brain but they're also really important in the function of the brain. Have you heard of these feel-good, happy neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine? Yeah? These are the ones we want, and we can only make them by nutrients that we get from food. So it's really important, the function of the brain as well as the structure. So we're going to look at both of those, but this is the neurotransmitters that make us happy. So in theory, obviously diet should be really important because we need certain nutrients to do it. I like to think of these nutrients as affecting the brain a little bit like we uh, think of when we're thinking about what we need for a car to work. So there's the car there. You need your petrol, your oil, your brake fluid. Antifreeze? Who put antifreeze in their car before they came away? Not me. <laughs> I should have done. I'm pretty sure it was freezing when I left England. Uh, not even a week ago, three days ago. Three days ago. Uh, and water. So those are the sort of things that we need to put into a car. The brain is really similar. We need loads of different things to get that function and structure working in the way that we want it to. So we've got the top there, we've got fluid. We've got omega-3 fat, which might be the equivalent to your oil in the car. And I'll tell you where that comes from in a minute. We've got carbohydrate, which is the fuel. We've got minerals like selenium, zinc, iron and iodine. Lots to think about there. We don't have to think about the nutrients. We'll see in a minute which foods they, they come in. But brain needs all of those to function. Protein. Amino acids are needed to make those feel-good neurotransmitters that I just mentioned. And vitamins. Some of the, the reactions that occur in our brain need vitamins as a, as a factor in the um, chemical reaction. And polyphenols. Who's heard of polyphenols? 
Yeah? It's, a, it's a new word in nutrition, which wasn't around when I trained. And basically, it's the colours that are in fruit and vegetables or other plant foods. And it seems that they have a real impact on the brain as well. So we'll look at all of these briefly. But I always think, phew, when I look at how many things are needed for our brains to work optimally. So I've taken all the research on mood and food that I could find, and I've condensed it into my top tips uh, of, of mood of sort of mood boosting things that you can do as far as food and drink are concerned. So number one is keep hydrated. Now this might surprise you, but it's really important. The brain is actually 75% water. That always surprises people. Uh, it's actually three quarters of the weight of our brain is, is water. So even 1% to 2% loss of fluid when we're a bit dehydrated can impact on how we think, feel, and behave. Has anybody noticed when they're dehydrated, they get a bit sluggish and tired and find it hard to concentrate? Yeah? There's a lot of work going on at the moment in workplaces, especially hot workplaces, to see if we can improve productivity and, and mood in the workplace by looking at hydration. So even 1% to 2% impairs mood and increases fatigue. It's really powerful. And 1% to 2% dehydration can occur very, very quickly, especially somewhere like where we are today in the heat. And the research that's been done, mostly it looks at how people perform under stressful operations. And I love these studies. I really want to take part in one of these. So they're usually lab simulation, and they've got people driving under really stressful conditions. So the lady's just sat there with her screens and has got to react. And what they do is they use normally hydrated people and dehydrated people. They're the same people, but when they're normally hydrated or when they're dehydrated. And look and see how they deal with stressful, uh, stressful driving conditions. And what they found is that dehydrated drivers make double the errors of hydrated drivers. So when you see those signs on the motorway saying, take a break because you're tired, it also means take a break because you might be dehydrated. So it's really important how our brain functions as to how hydrated we are. And what they found was that the level of the dehyd dehydrated drivers was the equivalent to the upper legal level of alcohol in terms of how much it impaired their functioning and their decision making. So it's a really quite, quite um, big effect that hydration has. What do you think those colours are? Anybody, let's ask the front row, what do you think those colours are? Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this gentleman's been to my lecture on a different year, so he knows. I'm not going to ask you any more of the questions. Uh, yes, they are the colours of urine. Now, I work in a, in a men's prison back in Bristol, where I live in the UK. And uh, it's one of the things that we do in prison is try to manage how people feel and respond to stress, because obviously a, a, a calm prison is a happier prison and a safer prison. So I do a lot of work on hydration with the prisoners. And I took this, it's a urine colour chart or a pee chart, and I took this in to show the prisoners uh, just, a, just a couple of months ago. And uh, I gave it to them, I said, what do you think this is? And one of the prisoners said, oh, it's a paint chart for what colour I can have my cell. <laughs> I really liked that. I said, no, I'm sorry, you don't get a choice of, <laughs> of cell colour. But it does look a bit like a paint chart, doesn't it? But actually, it's a pea chart. And the top three are the colour that our urine should be if we're well hydrated. The darker, the more dehydrated. Now, there's all sorts of fancy ways that, that doctors measure hydration, but for most of us, that is good enough. That's a really good sign. So I'd really encourage you to have a think about, about that. And there we are. Good, the first three top ones. And then anything down from four is starting to be dehydrated. And you can see the bottom one is, is really dark. 
I, I, I also use this chart. I work at the London Marathon and uh, as a fluid advisor at the London Marathon. And we use this chart at the London Marathon as well. And I took it along and we had a gentleman who um, is the oldest person to have ever finished the London Marathon. He's done, I think he's done about 15 of them. And he looked at my chart and he said, oh yes, that's me down at the bottom there, this, this one here. So I said, my goodness, are you sure? And he said, yeah, that's how I take my tea, with two sugars. And I'd say, no, I'm sorry, it's a pea chart. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's a, very important that it's a pea chart, not a tea chart. <laughs> so how much do we need and what? Well, you've probably heard this message of six to eight. That's a really good message. So it's six to eight mugs or glasses of roughly 250 mils. Because we all get some of our fluid from food. So it comes from things like soup or um, fruit and vegetables. Most foods have got some fluid in them. But we still need, as drinks, around six to eight. We need more if it's hot. So the sort of weather that we've been having, uh, since, certainly since I got on at Barbados, uh, or if we're very active. So I've seen all the people walking around deck, uh, deck seven really quite strongly or using up the gym. So we need more if we're active or it's hot. But that six to eight is a good rule of thumb. But what is confusing about the message is it's not six to eight glop cups or glasses of water. It's six to eight fluid. So that can include lots of other things. So it can include tea or herbal tea, can include coffee, can include milk, fruit juice, smoothies, squash, even includes fizzy drinks. Obviously, if you're having fizzy drinks, generally you're getting quite a lot of sugar, unless you're having the sugar-free ones. Uh, so that's not something that most of us need. But all of these will count towards your fluid. And I certainly don't have six to eight cups of water a day. Um, so I think that message is, you know, it's really difficult for, for people to achieve that. So if you think six to eight fluid, it's a lot easier. But as I said, bear in mind that's the minimum. But lots of things count. Just a quick word about tea and coffee, because that is, as I said, one of the things that people get really confused about. They think tea and coffee don't count. They do contribute to fluid intake. And tea has got a specific amino acid in it called L-theanine, which actually has been shown to be really mood-enhancing. So this whole idea of a cup of tea <laughs> when we're stressed, there is something behind that, both from the fluid and the fact that it's got really useful amino acids in it. Uh, so caffeine intakes up to about two to three cups of coffee or about five to eight cups of tea, depending how big they are, doesn't have any negative impact on fluid balance. They have a positive benefit in terms of fluid. And I do a lot of work in care homes in the UK, and a lot of our care home residents never drink water, but they will drink tea. Uh, so it's a really good way of um, having fluid. And the other benefit is things like moderate caffeine from tea or coffee increases our alertness, it boosts our feelings of energy and good mood, and actually in some people causes a bit of a release of that dopamine, that feel-good neurotransmitter I was talking about. So all in all, coffee good. So for all of those of you who, put, who said boosting for the coffee, that was right. The only downside is if you have too much, it can make people feel a bit jittery, a bit irritable, and it can affect sleep, which in turn affects mood. So it's one of those things.